There's no secret. There's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent. Be still and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't going to happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. If you are looking to live at the tip of the spear when it comes to health optimization, join my private membership group, Fully Optimized Health. Dot com and get the latest and greatest on hormone optimization, peptides, fitness, fat loss, and most importantly, raising your vibration. Again, go over to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up today. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you might be around the world. Of course, you are watching the Jay Campbell podcast, and I am very excited today to be joined by in my virtual StreamYard studio all the way across the pond, many ponds, actually with Lisa Tamati, who is in Australia. And obviously today is uh, Thursday, uh, June 27th uh, for that marker. But uh, Lisa, how are you? It's very good to have you here today. Excellent, Jay. I'm actually in New Zealand, you know, like- I'm from New Zealand, that's right. I literally just called Australia and she's in New Zealand. I, your voice <laughs> triggered me. I apologize. I have many yeah, friends, many Kiwi friends, and I apologize, but thank you for correcting me. <laughs> Um, okay, so let me give you guys her bio real quick. So she is a former ultra endurance athlete turned health optimization expert, the author of five books, which she sent to me. Thank you so much for doing that. Her journey began with her mother's medical crisis, driving her to research and rehabilitate. I've obviously been on her podcast and, you know, I heard her entire mom's story and, you know, everybody has a similar story, I think, in the optimization space of like figuring out like how damaged sick care slash allopathic medicine is. Uh, but she hosts a top rank podcast speaks internationally and runs a hyperbaric oxygen therapy clinic and operates a biotech company focusing on longevity supplements. And again, I've been on her podcast and she's very, very knowledgeable. She has a full blown six pack and she's in her mid fifties. She looks better than most 25 year old women. That's a fact. Um, but you know, today, obviously we've got a lot to talk about your mom's story being one, obviously your story, your biohacking journey. Uh, but I'm, you know, asking a lot of my, um, interviews or interviewees now when they come on the podcast because because again it's mid-june of 2024 isn't it incredible how fast time is moving um where you are on the gamut of you know humanity like over the next three to five to ten years are you a buyer of humanity or are you a seller <laughs> you know like I, i'm definitely a, a glass half full person so you've got to be positive because if you don't you know you're never going to get anywhere i think we're in dire straits i think we've got some major issues but then there's this massive amount of people that are waking up to what's going yes. on in the world and, and and great people like you that are sharing fabulous content and you know we just keep chipping away chipping away and trying to do our little part in the world and, and what i try to do is what i did when i'm doing ultra marathons is not focus too far ahead because it just completely overwhelms you right i always like to focus on okay what's the next step what, what can i do today what can i do in the next minute what can i do in the next week you know and keep my focus there because once you start looking up and going oh my god there's wars there's this there's that there's horrible things happening everywhere you just get overwhelmed you know so <clears throat> when you're taking on massive challenges, you've just got to really pull your focus in to what you can cope with and what you can deal with today. I think that's really key. That's awesome. Yeah, um, I agree. A hundred percent, you know, glass half full. I mean, you have to look at life from a perspective, from a perspective of abundance and prosperity, if you want abundance and prosperity, right? Because all we are is our thoughts. Yeah. So, you know, I always tell people like, yeah, we all have quote unquote good days and bad days, but <laughs> keep your thoughts focused on productivity, on creating a better reality, creating a better life. And that's exactly what you get. Because again, we are master reality creators. And truthfully, Lisa, we are living in a simulation, you know, and when you're in a simulated reality, it means that it's a gift that we're in a simulation because if it wasn't a simulation, no one would be able to create their reality. We would all just be, you know, on the wheels of time robots and destiny would be unavoidable. But thankfully that it is a simulated reality and we can control it and create a better one. I always tell people like, again, change your thoughts. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's literally that simple. Like who cares how negative your dad died, your mom died, your husband divorced you, you know, you lost this, you lost that, you know, okay, that's great. You know, those were experiences. Did you learn and grow from them? If you didn't, that's fine too, but change your thoughts. Yep. Change your thoughts. 
<clears throat> I think it's just absolutely crucial. And the things that I've gone through in life that have been absolute, you know, horrifically horrible stuff that you don't want to happen to anybody. But when, when these things happen, like with mum's story, which we'll get into a little bit later, when you're told, like, you know, she's buggered, put her in an institution, she's never going to make it. And then you're just going, nah, that's not that's not what I'm going to accept and I'm going to go down fighting. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a warrior, I'm a fighter. And that really doesn't go well down well in the, the medical world because they want people to, you know, sign your advanced care planning they hear, say here and, you know, just usher people out the door. Um, and they don't really like it when they come up against someone who fights back and fights for their loved ones and doesn't want to give in. And they're going, you can't, you know, you just have to accept the reality. It's like, piss off. I'm not accepting any reality. And like, you know, you accept the reality of death when, you, when you're actually gone. That's all that you, you know, and even then a fight you know, um, to con to connect on the other side, so to speak. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's really, really important that you believe you can, because when you take on massive challenges, you know, like Mum's story, yeah. which you'll get into, it, 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 you you have to have a vision. You have to believe that you can get there. And then there'll be a million moments along the way where you're crying on the floor in the bathroom and just going, I can't do this anymore. But the thing is that you get back up the next moment and you do it again. And that's the that's the key, right? It's like standing back up. It's okay to cry. It's okay to fail. It's okay to fall down. It's okay to think get negative thoughts for five minutes and then get your shit together and get back up again. You know? That's literally the key. The statement, yep. never give up. Right. Yep. You think about that, no matter how bad it might be or what you've overcome or what you are facing and how miserable you are. Yeah. And that's a perfect statement. We've all been there where we cried and we're like, what's the purpose of, of continuing? You know, F this. I can't keep doing it. But yes, there's some voice. And that's the divine connection, obviously, that we have. Right. It's our higher self. But that's the thing that separates achievers from non-achievers, because the achievers keep going under all the adversity, no matter what happens to them. And, you know, unfortunately, some people don't, some people do quit. Some people do give up. Some people do attach themselves to their diagnosis and give up. But if you want to live in this world and you want to make it, you know, and obviously, you know, I always talk about the spiritual evolution of the soul and that's really all that matters. But obviously a lot of people aren't into spiritually evolving, right? Like they're into materialism, you know, they're into like whatever it is that, you know, and, and again, I'm not going to judge them or label them or, you know, even on this podcast, you know, that's one of the things I've had to learn is because I'm obviously like you, a very spiritually evolved person. And when people tell me they're not into spiritual, you know, evolution, it's kind of like, what? And then you, you know, but then you, you experience more and more of those people, you know, you find them the trust the science people where everything for them has to be physically observable, right? Like I have to touch it, feel it, smell it, know it's real. God doesn't exist. You know, there's no angels. There's no divinity. All that's bullshit. It's in your mind. If it's not science-based, I don't trust it. And it's like, those people are going to be who they're going to be. And you and I and people like us can't convince them. Otherwise, that's fine. But I used to be in resistance to them. You know, I'd be like, oh, you're an idiot. You know, how can you not believe in a higher power and a creative force and blah, blah, blah. But like, let them be who they're going to be. That's, that's the way it is. You know? And I think, yeah, we've all got our own evolution to go through <clears throat> right. and reasons for them to be that way. And, you know, like if I look, you know, look back over my life, it's, you know, it's it's constantly evolving. You know, I'm sure. constantly trying to work out who the heck I am, where the heck I'm going and what, you know, and I you know, still don't know what I want to be when I grow up, you know, like <laughs> there's yeah. a lot to learn in this world. But um, I think, yeah, you're right. And like for me, spirituality sort of hit me in the face. Well, actually, when I was a teenager, I joined a, a church, you know, because uh, back then they were talking about cashless societies and all that sort of stuff. And I was like, oh, God, you know, and then I found out that, you know, that that, that wasn't the, the way forward for me. But um, <clears throat> when my dad died a few years ago, that really, you know, like I was like, what is the point? Where the hell, is, where, where did he go? Where is he? You know, and that really made me open up to that whole side and, you know, my dad sends me signs all the time. You know, like I, 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 I believe that, and and uh, we have a connection and a relationship that goes beyond what I can't see him, I can't touch him, I can't hug him. You know, which is terrible, but I still have that com communication. And we have this one, uh, this silly sign that I always tell dad to send me blue elephants. And the amount of blue elephants that pop up in my world is just that you know an image that I just 
pulled out of my head one day and said, right, Dad, if you're there, <laughs> send me a blue elephant. And I get them all the time. Like, it's just really, really funny. My, um, my wife gets the exact same thing with her mother, who's obviously passed too, with um, hummingbirds. Wow. And she does the same thing. She does the same thing. She's like, mom, I know you're around, you know, and just give me confirmation. You know, I know that you're going to, a hummingbird's going to appear in the next 30 seconds. And it's usually 20 seconds. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got a bird here too. Think that, that stuff is not true or it's woo or whatever. And it's just because they're not connected. I mean, we're, we're eternal energy, spiritual beings. And when we die physically, we're still around energetically, but people just don't understand that. But I, we could, you and I could talk about this all day. I don't want to rabbit hole. Um, you are an extreme, <laughs> you are an extreme sport athlete. You know, you're a, 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 a ultra competitive athlete. You've done all sorts of like amazing, you know, long distance stuff and talk about that a little bit. Like, you know, what can people learn from, you know, extreme sport athletes? Yeah, so, I mean, I spent 25 years racing the world's toughest endurance races, you know, so ultra marathons, um, did over 70,000 kilometers in that time, you know, did a couple of thousand Ks in the Sahara and the Moroccan and the Arabian, the Libyan, Desert, Niger, Jordan, Gobi, Death Valley in the USA, outback of Australia, Himalayas, um, ran right through New Zealand at one point for, for charity. Um, and you, you, the, the thing is, like, the, the funny thing about my story, Jay, is that I have absolutely no talent whatsoever to be an ultramarathon runner. <laughs> I'm not fast. Like, you put me in a local 5K race and I'm in the back third, you know. Like, I'm asthmatic. I broke my back when I was 21. I was never meant to be able to run again, you know, all of these things. That I, but I just wanted to do it. And I, you know, I grew into it, you know, and, and I just loved the adventure and I loved, you know, pushing the limits and, and so I, I got good at it but by sheer, like, you know, <laughs> grit and guts and just I could outstand most people. So even though I was very slow as a runner, I could just keep going and going and going for days, you know, and I came became good at that one particular thing. And I've had, you know, massive uh, successes and massive failures. You know, there's been horrific moments, life-threatening moments. There's, you know, when you're in the middle of the desert and, you've run out of water and you don't know when you're lost and you're, or you're surrounded by wild dogs or running across Niger where there's like a truck pulls up to you in the middle of the Sahara with like a hundred blokes on top of it. And you're a girl <laughs> running through the, you know, like moments where you think I am not getting out of this alive, you know, or crossing the Libyan desert. We did an illegal expedition across the Libyan desert, you know, back in the day when it was, uh, you couldn't do that. And, uh, yeah, we ended up, you know, running out of water. We only had two liters of water a day and 35 kilo backpacks, and I only weighed like 58 kilos or so. Um, you know, so it was pretty extreme that one actually, and that was a, a real turning point in my life. That was actually before I got into the ultra marathoning. Um, to just to tell you that story, I, I was with a young man back then who was, you know, a real um, extreme athlete. Taught me lots. We travelled the world together. But he was really abusive, so it was a really abusive relationship. And in the middle of this Libyan desert, this was the first time we'd done anything with anybody else, and he starts abusing me. And one of the other guys, Elvis, who's the head of the expedition, he goes, hang on a minute, you can't treat it like that. And so these two big alpha males have a big fight, right? And uh, we're in the middle of a 250-kilometer crossing of the Libyan desert. <laughs> and wow. we only have two liters of water a day, so we're all severely dehydrated, which means we're in a torturous space. Like, it's really yeah. – it's it's horrible. So you you're short tempered. You you know you're yeah. angry, um, and these two guys are having a go. At, at, you know, and I'm like going, you know, crikey, I can barely stand up. Like I, you know, right. 35 kilos on on my frame. Right. But guys had to put me on my feet to go. And my the boyfriend wanted me to help with the book that we were producing for about this desert, and he wanted me to help set up the, the shots. And Elvis, who was the leader of the expedition, and that was his real name, he was a Yugoslavian survival expert, and he, he was like, well, we've got to keep moving. I don't care whether you do your photography and doing this book or whatever, but we've got to cover 45 kilometres a day with these backpacks on, so we're moving when we're moving. You know, we're going, and if you want to take sh shots, then do it. And he was wanting, the boyfriend wanted me to set up shot, you know, tripods and run around after him. And I'm like, I just physically couldn't do it, right? I was yeah. at the limits just walking. And so he would, you know, he was telling me how useless I was and I couldn't do anything. Right. And, you know, right. 
And so on day four in the middle of this desert, um, he says, right, that's it, you can stay with him, then I'm leaving and our relationship's over and we've been together for five years, you know. And wow. uh, and he, he, he literally disappeared over the sand dunes and left me there. And I was, in, we were in dire straits. Like we did not have enough water. We were severely dehydrated. We didn't wow. know if we were going to survive. I didn't know whether he would survive out there on his own. And um, I started to fall apart, you know, because my relationship's just gone to, you know, custard. And then I realized like, I, I can't fall apart here because I've got to survive. I've got to get yeah. out. And I, and I owe it to the other guys not to cause any more trouble, right? So, you know, the guy said to me, you're going to be all right? And I'm like, yep, let's go, you know. So at that moment, I learned really something about compartmentalizing. Sure. Like, okay, I'm going to deal with the shit of the relationship later. I've got to survive right, right now. So I've got mission mode. And I don't know whether he's going to make it or I'm going to make it, but we'll work that stuff out later. Right now, I just got to keep moving, you know. And so, long story short, we did make it out. He made it out before us. We were in dire, dire straits. And you'll have to read my first book, Running Hot, for that story. Um, but that was a turning point in my life where I went, and nobody's going to treat me like that again. And I'm going to pull myself out of the. And it took me two years to recover physically from that, uh, you know, expedition. If it took it's took, taken me decades to get over the whole you know trauma of the, the stuff that came after that and happened during that but at the end of the day all of that experience just made me who I am you know like it made me stronger and more um, I'm not going to go through that again I'm not going to let someone treat me like that again and that was the lowest point in my life and then I sort of you know then I got into the ultra marathoning after that two years later I did my first one when I was like I want more adventure but I don't want to do it in such a crazy manner anymore I want to have a little bit more security around me <laughs> and, uh, and then you know did uh, my first race in the marathon the Sables in Morocco and that was a 240k race and I just with the most wonderful people when you're all just on, on this mission together the 700 yeah. runners running across the desert and it was meant to be the toughest race on earth back then and I was comparing it to everything I'd done in the Libyan Desert, and I'm like, I reckon I can do this. I've never, never run an ultra in my life, but I thought, well, it's the same distance, and I've only got to carry 10 kilos, not 35, and I get nine litres of water, and I've got doctors, and I've got, you know, I, I, I can handle this. Right. So I did that, and then I was just addicted, and then it was just one after the other, after the other, after the other, and, yeah, 25 years later, <laughs> I've now retired from doing that stuff. Um, because now I want to live longer, right? <clears throat> yeah. Now sure. it's all about longevity and optimization. And I can tell you those listening, you know, like when I was 25 or when I was 30 and 35, I was slightly overweight. I was uh, uh, running horrific distances. Uh, I had a flaccid upper body. I had incredibly strong legs, but running was not the way to lose weight. Running was not the way to be optimized. It's, uh, it was, I was good at that, but that's all I was good at. And now like at 55 and after learning, you know, the past decade about how to optimize yourself and longevity and biohacking and all the rest of the things and peptides and all that sort of good stuff, um, fitter, healthier, stronger, leaner, better than I was at 25. Yeah. I can't run, I can't run 200 Ks at a time anymore, but. Yeah, but you wouldn't, I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to anyway. Right. No. I mean, that was, a different, that was a different time and a different place for you. And again, it's just your story is just what, you know, more evidence that we come here to evolve and grow. And, you know, every experience, whether it's with a crazy ex boyfriend or, or ex husband or ex wife or whatever, is valuable. But only when you look at it from a perspective of, hmm, I learned from this, I want less of this and more of that. But yep. most people, again, don't, and I shouldn't say most people, because like you said earlier, a lot of people are waking up and that's cool. But at the end of the day, most people still do not evolve and grow from the bad things that happen to them. And even when, when I say bad things that happen to them, you know this, I know this, nothing is bad when you're actually learning from it, right? It's an opportunity for growth, but you have to observe it from a place of neutrality, you know, and granted, I know that, you know, people will say, oh, that's not true, Jay. When it happens, it's bad, right? And maybe you do experience negative feelings or emotions around it. Mm. But at the same time, you know, life is about learning. L you know, life is learning lessons are, I mean, uh, you know, 
living is learning lessons are fun you know what i mean so like the truth is is like it's just you have to come from a place of like everything that happens to me is an opportunity for me to evolve doesn't matter what it is doesn't matter how bad it is at the moment that it happens but if i judge it and i attach to negative slash pain from when it happens then i won't ever evolve and grow from it so the soul or the person the entity itself has to learn that everything that happens to you has benefit yep. you might not totally see it right away but you will evolve, ultimately see it at some point in your life and i think that's the difference between success and mediocrity is that the people that truly do expand over time in in you know in everything and knowledge and awareness and wisdom and, and wealth and you know whatever however you want to evaluate it they can look at everything that happened to them and, and grow from it and a lot yep. of people as you know don't yep and you you know i think you can turn like you know i wrote a book about mum's journey like my mum had a just for the audience um a massive aneurysm and, and stroke uh, nine years ago and was left you know, medical misadventure from the get-go. So they said she was having a migraine and left her dying there for six hours before anything was happening. And that really put me on hyper alert because when I realized that, because back then I didn't know anything about anything, right? I right. wasn't into the, this world. I was just an athlete, crazy athlete. Right. And, <clears throat> and I didn't know what to ask for. I didn't know what to do. I didn't, and, and they were just telling me it was a migraine and I knew it was much more and I didn't know what to ask for though. And so, um, we, I managed to get a friend of mine who was a paramedic and she came up and she looked at mum and went, yep, she's having an aneurysm or a stroke and told this doctor in no uncertain terms to get her help now, get a CT. And then they found out, yeah, there's blood right throughout the brain. So that put me on hypervigilance that the, the doctors aren't always going to pick up everything, right? So then I was like, if she survives this, God, whatever is out there, I, you know, just, I will, I will learn from it. I will, I will do whatever it takes to get her back. Just give us a chance, give us a chance, you know? And then we had a brilliant surgeon who saved her life and, you know, she, she was in and out of coma for three weeks and they didn't know if she would make it, but she eventually did. And in this time, I'm just studying my heart out and I haven't stopped. And we're 10 years later now or nine years later. And it's it's been this biggest evolution. And in this time when my mum actually came out of the coma, she had massive brain damage, not much over a vegetative state, you know, like real and she was 74 years old, medical professionals all going, look, there's no chance here. She's never gonna come back. You have to put her in a home. She's 24-7, two person round the clock here, and you're never gonna cope, right? And I and I just went, no, I'm gonna fight with everything I have. And my family was behind me. And um, I had the social worker who was dead set on putting her in an institution. Yeah. And he would he was fighting because it was out of their budget then, right? And it was so this is what you need to understand from Unreal. the story, people, is that you they not got your best interest at heart, they got the, the best interest of the, the budget at heart. And yeah. so that would have been out of their budget if we put her into an institution, right? And not if they came home, if she came home to us and we were to care for her, they'd still have to be responsible for her and help us with, with um, you know, caregiving and all of that sort of stuff. And so they didn't want that. And so this social worker, you know, was dead set on, on trying to stop us um, getting her home. And so I had a hell of a battle. Now, my brother, um, he looks like The Rock, you know, like Dwayne Johnson. And so I took him to all the meetings and um, I managed to get, you know, all the resources that we needed to bring her home, you know. That's hilarious. Um, but I had to, like I, he, I was getting pushed around, like they were pushing me around, but they couldn't push my brother around. And so I eventually got what I needed to bring her home, which is just the basics, like some caregiving and, you know, just help with, with uh, rehabilitation, which ended up being not much at all. But and when I got her home, I'd come across something called hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And this, I, I realized, was her only, well, one of her major chances uh, if I could get her this. So I, we didn't have one in our hometown, a, a clinic. And so I went to a local uh, dive company that had a chamber because they use this for dive accidents, right? And, um, and I begged these people, can I please bring my very sick mum? Here's all my research. This is, and they knew that hyperbaric was powerful because they'd used this for years and they knew how good it was. And they were like, will you sign a legal waiver and we'll let you use it? Amazing people, right? They let us do that. And I, so I, bought, I got her out of the hospital. The moment I got her out of the hospital after three months, took her straight down to this factory and we stuck her on a forklift and we put her into this big chamber because she couldn't move at anything, right? She was just like completely gone. 
no, no, nobody home. And we started to do treatments and we did 33 treatments there. And then she started to respond. Like she didn't start to get up and walk already, but she was starting to move her hand. She was trying to talk. She was trying to get up and, and I knew it was working. And then I lost access to the chamber. So then I mortgaged the house and I bought a chamber and I stored it in my house and I worked out how to get her inside it because that was pretty difficult because she couldn't get in, right? <laughs> and I just had one obstacle after the other to overcome. But we just, as a family, we, we did this. We, we put her through treatment yeah. after treatment. And then I started studying functional neurology and how the brain works and how I could reestablish a vestibular system and a keto diet and supplementation and peptides and everything else and known to man. And I became her, you know, like I just stayed one step ahead of her in her, in her progress. And we had an eight hour program every day that I would put her through. And the doctors were like, but she's got neural fatigue. There's no way you can do more than a couple of minutes of time. And I'm like, yes, there is. We do a couple of minutes and then I'll do something else with her. I will move her legs or I will want her brain is resting or, you know, like there is a way to, if you're dedicated. So it took me two years of this like full dedication, basically, to get her out of the wheelchair. It took about, well, about 15 months, I think, to get her out of the wheelchair and for her to take her first steps. By two and a half years, she had her full driver's license, her full power of attorney awesome. back. She was going to the gym every day. She was, she'd lost, she's lost over 50 kilos on this journey because she was, you know, an overweight mum, <laughs> she was, because she was always look, looking after her kids instead of herself. Um, and she became metabolically fit and healthy and just, you know, and I've written a book. So this is the the book that I wrote about that. Oh, can you yep, see that? You sent me that. Yeah, yep. that's my mum on the front cover. And but unfortunately, that was only round one, Jay, <laughs> Right. <laughs> when I wrote the book. And then three years ago after you know being back to health and everything or we lost my dad four years ago and that knocked the hell out of my mum because they've been together for 55 years sure. you know? and um off the back of that she ended up developing a a, a brain cancer um, a cns lymphoma and once again i had medical misadventure after misadventure i took her into the hospital and half of her face had you know dropped on one side and she was slurring her speech and i'm like oh my god she's having another stroke tore into the hospital they sent me home I went back up two days later they sent me home and it took me three weeks of fighting just to get an MRI and I eventually um, rang up the radiology person I said hey this is my whole backstory I need an MRI nobody will give me and the lady there said just be here tomorrow at eight o'clock and I'll get you in and I'm like thank you okay so I came in there and brought mum and it came that she had a um, came out that she had a massive she had multiple tumors in the brain she had one the size of a grapefruit and um then they were like oh okay uh so then they sent us down and we did an operation they took that massive tumor out and it turned out to be a very aggressive cns lymphoma and they said right there's nothing we could do she's 70 uh, she's 80 at this point there's you know go home get ready to die and so that round that was the beginning of round two jay so then i went back to my network because like you I've got a big network of of people that I'm connected to and some pretty cool yep. doctors and I went help help I need help like this is a situation and I started reaching out to people that were knew about the metabolic approach to health cancer and uh, to cancer and all the adjunct therapies and I started to put 15 doctors on her team so so I'm now the CEO of these you know like this this team yeah. as well and yeah. I'm like putting, you know, throwing the house at it. Literally, we, we spent, you know, the price of a house on on on, on everything that I could possibly do because I had weeks. They said, you've got weeks before she yeah. dies. And yeah. so I was went like full bore, both the the, um, the traditional stuff as well as the, the adjunct therapies and the metabolic approach. I did advanced genetic testing, found out what she would respond to, uh, her particular tumours. So I went and developed you know, all the supplement protocols. We did um, temozolomide as a as a one form of chemo that she was going to respond to. I didn't want to do chemo, but I decided I'd do this because I was just chucking the bus at it at this point. And the genetic test that I had um, had come back that she would respond to that, and that was not standard of care. So I had to chase oncologists right around the country, private oncology, to try to get this one particular type that they didn't use for this. But I got it, and um, and then within twelve weeks we got rid of the tumours on, on the brain. 
Like we wow. did an MRI 12 weeks later, they were gone and we're now three years in and we've managed to maintain that. And um, she's, you know, does hyperbaric oxygen most days. She does intravenous vitamin C. She's on all sorts of peptides. And I can tell you, Jay, your your work in the peptide space has been super valuable. So thank you so much for everything that you do because that's enabled me to work it out because I'm in New Zealand, right? We cannot get peptides. We cannot get peptides. And I was struggling around trying to work out what research labs can I trust. Yeah, you know, yeah. and 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 through you and through finding limitless, and um, I've been able to do that and get that's what awesome. she needs. So that's been you know life saving for her because well, I've got her on everything. You, let me let me ask you on that because obviously we're going to get a ton of people that watch this yeah. and, and they're going to ask like, what cognitive restoration uh, peptides have you guys used? And and in the dosage before they say you didn't get the dosage. Yeah, yeah. So I do. I have done the very first one I did was cerebralisin. Now. You can't get cerebralisin, right? It isn't, you know. So I had to go. You can from limitless now, but at that can time you, you couldn't. Yeah, yeah well, you can get it from limitless right now. Yeah, this is like two years ago, and so yeah, you couldn't get I it had at to. All. I had to go to Austria, like Austria. Wow. I, I lived in Austria for thirteen years, and so I had a doctor who would prescribe, get it sent to a chemist in Austria, get it sent to a friend over there, and they'd send it out. But I could only get the small one mil vials, which are a joke, you know, like you need a you need to be mainlining this stuff really. Um, so I did that. Um, then I've um, recently put C Max and C Lank in, but only recently, uh, actually off the back of your work. Um, and then I've been doing uh, I've done Ipamorelin, VPC, TV five hundred. Um, what else have we done? Oh, um, MK six seven seven, IGF. What is it? LR3, uh, IGF1, yep. LR3. Um, yeah, it was, uh, quite a raft of, of different peptides over the period, and I've been testing and trialing and what I can get through. You know, like a, a lot of it has been, you know, uh, stuck on the, the border, so to speak, and um, been a bit difficult to get in. But yeah, so I've done all of that, plus I've done red light photobiomodulation therapy, and I'm about to get a new one called New Radiant, which I'm excited about because that one's got some pretty – have you interviewed those guys at New um, – uh, familiar with them. Ironic. No, I know you're talking about, but I haven't interviewed them, now. Oh, well, if you want a connection. Yeah, I, I'm just about to start with that, and I've I've, I've been doing uh, Lou Lim's Violite stuff for the last few years as well, and yeah. um, that, that's been very helpful as well. Um, so basically every, every possible angle that I could possibly do um, and yeah, we, she's got disabilities now mainly because she had, um, or well, she broke a hip four months ago. She got, she got up and fell over and broke a hip. And so that's been another mission. So I'm just rehabilitating her back from that. Um, but she's still enjoying life. She's walking again, you know, and most people are, now she's 82 after a, breaking your hip, you don't usually, you know, get up out of the wheelchair, especially when you had so many comorbidities as she's had. Um, but she's back walking again and back enjoying life again. And we're just in the, on the comeback trail. And, you know, we're off to the gym after I get off this. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, I mean, your mom is what now? She's 82? 82, yep. And how would you rate her health from a standpoint of like, is she completely lucid, like all there, like way better than most 82-year-old women? Yeah, so she's got some deficits. Like she loses it quickly. Like if she gets an infection, a UTI or something like that, um, actually methylene blue has been a godsend on that front. I've found methylene blue to be a massive um, repair of the brain and uh, also stopped her having recurrent UTIs that we were struggling with. Um, so now she's, she has got some impairments, but she can you know talk intelligently to you she can read, she can write, she has, you know, the ability to, to um, enjoy her grandchildren and go out with her girlfriends, but she does need supervision now. Like she needs supervision to walk around the house just because of we're rehabilitating from the from the hip thing. And she's got um, water on the brain, so hydrocephalus. So her balance is uh, now, um, you know, worse than it was. And so I'm trying to get the neurosurgeons to put in a stent to try to get the water off the brain, unless you know something else that could get rid of water on the brain. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I mean, there's a lot of things that, but, but not for someone at 82. Be, yeah. It's, yeah. So she can't travel too far or things like that. No. So, you know, um, 
so yeah, we've got some limitations now, but still very much enjoying life. And you know, she was on a in a um, a movie recently, the cancer cancer revolution. They interviewed us for that, um, and uh, to tell mum's story because it's you know it's quite amazing. And I, I've written a book actually. It's an audio book. It's an interview series from with all of these world leading doctors and scientists on the metabolic approach to cancer. And it's called What Your Oncologist Isn't Telling You. And that's a huge resource for anybody who's listening who's dealing with cancer. If you want to have it all in one place, that's a really good book to get because I, I, I interviewed all these people. And I'm like, what? Am I, I've got to I got to do something with all this work, right? There's there's a really good book on cancer that I was actually just I finished about two weeks ago and I was just yeah. reading a review of it. It's from Gabor Dr. Gabor Mate from oh, yeah, Canada. Yeah. I know him. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you know who he is, but he just yeah. published a book on what cancer really comes from. And mm -hmm. it's you know, your mom's cancer was obviously from the stress and the the, the depression she went from losing her, your dad. Because what ends up happening is people, you know, a lot of people don't get rid of the stress or the anxiety that comes from some traumatic event. And they're, you know, they're, they're, they're just, you know, some of us just hold things in and some of us are like, you know, like me, if it happens, I just blow it all out. And so I, it's, it's rare for something like that for me to manifest, but for most people who struggle with their emotions or struggle to release or to communicate effectively, like when they're really stressed out because they don't want to, they don't want to upset anybody. Right. So those are the people that are more likely, he writes about this in the book, but those are the people that are more likely to manifest cancer because there's no outlet for it. And it's like yeah. this emotional release that never comes. Yeah. And so eventually it systemically weakens them. And then that, you know, it creates obviously an inflammatory cascade or pathway. And then eventually they get cellular degradation and then cellular degradation leads to cancer. But in your mom's case, she was already older, right? So mm -hmm. It wasn't like she was like a 40 year old woman getting cancer, which is how it normally happens. But he talks about in the book, and it's a very profound book. And, and, and Dr. Mate is an amazing guy. I mean, he's, he's very dry when you listen to him interviews, right? Like he's not, a, <laughs> he's not going to impress you on a podcast. He's no, Jay he, <laughs> no or, or, or Lisa Mate. So, I mean, the, the truth is, I mean, he's, he's a brilliant researcher yeah. and, and a genius man but you have to read his book. And unfortunately, as you know, Lisa, most people can't even read today. They'll be like, Oh, oh, I need a, I need a podcast. <laughs> Do they have an audio book? You know, it's like, dude, but I'll, I'll forward you an email that I had from today from some guy named Joe Burt. That's not his real name, but he's some guy that has a big email list and he writes about alternative health and he did a really concise breakdown on the book. It's crazy, right? Because I just read the book myself like two weeks ago. And then I got his email today and I was like, that's interesting. He's like reviewing the book. Wow. And it was a really concise breakdown of the book. But I mean, again, I've said this for three years since I figured it out. And I will say this until I'm dead in this incarnation. All physiological disease states or ideologies come from spiritual amputation. Mm -hmm. And it's somewhere that we have had a trauma in our life. Sometimes it's psychological, but obviously oftentimes it's physiological and we don't integrate it. And for whatever reason, we don't integrate it because it's too hard. You know, we're ashamed. We don't know how to communicate to our significant other that, you know, this has harmed us or we're emotionally devastated over it. And then that festers Lisa, you know, mm -hmm. and, and then it creates, you know, some form of a physiological disease state. And, you know, you know this because you're so deep into this world, but women are very notorious and prone to autoimmune issues because they don't release stress. They, mm -hmm. especially mothers, right? Like a mother, a good mother takes on everybody's problems. They solve every problem. You know, I used to joke about my wife, Monica, you know, she would be, we'd be going to bed at night, traveling and, you know, about to have sex or get intimate or whatever. And she'll be like the dog. <laughs> like, they feed the dog. And I'm looking at her like, who fucking cares? Right. Like, but that's how women are, right? Like very powerful women, maternal women are caregivers and care providers. And so they're literally in their mind, they're processing everything. Yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And, Your mom and the same, but in the same thing, they, they struggle to communicate sometimes when they're really hurt emotionally and they keep it in pent up inside. And then, you know, over time, autoimmune, yep. you know, I mean, I could give you a hundred 
disease diagnosis of autoimmune and all the time it's unreleased trauma or stress yeah so but yeah get it out there but it is it's really hard and you know we, we've got conditioning and you don't rock the oh it's all brainwashing you're... they brainwash <laughs> women to take care of everybody's problems dude yeah, yeah yeah i mean i do it like i know my in my family you know like I'm a mum's caregiver, obviously, 24-7. Yes. Around yes. the clock, I'm doing everything and running a number of companies and uh, I'm blind myself to bits a lot of the time, right? Yes. You know, and, yes. and what, what, yes. what gives? I'm not going to – there is no way in hell I'm letting my loved ones down. You know, there right. is no way in hell. Right. So I know that I'm, I'm, you know, at risk of, you know, the stress levels – because of the stress levels of, that, I, that I operate under, but – you know, I can look myself in the mirror, and I and I right. know that I'm doing the very, very best that I can that I can be. But it, it's tough sometimes because you are like, especially if you're a loving, caring person. Right. And you know, like I'm a, I'm a. Don't get me wrong, I'm a shitty, uh, grumpy, uh, really tough coach. You know, like a lot sure. of people look at me with mum, and they're like, "Why are you so hard on her? You're so mean. Why are you yeah. yelling at her?" And I'm like, "Because if I don't, she won't." She's stay going bye Right. She's going bye bye, and I am not letting her go. You know, like, and I'm, you know, she wants to stay here too, and so we fight, and you know, we we have our little squabbles at the gym because she doesn't want to push push that hard or do that much, and I'm like, you know, people think, oh, you're so nasty. It's love though. It's like tough love, right? I have to be that. But it's really hard to be that and be the daughter and be the, you know, the wife and the, um, but, you know, I've chosen this life and I could just leave. A lot of people just let their loved ones, stick them in a home, let them go. Oh, there's nothing that can be done. And, you know, like for me, if you've had a good parent who's given everything for you, um, you owe it to them. You know, to do the very best you can be. And not everybody can care for them at home. I understand that. Because, you know, like that, this, you know, like we've got a, like talking about the the tsunami of Alzheimer's and cognitive decline oh. coming at us, man. Like this is going to destroy our society because I'm living it 24-7 and have been, you know, looking after mum for nine years now. And the implications economically for me, because I can't travel, I can't go to your yeah. amazing conferences, yeah. I can't hop right. on a plane and meet you in person, I can't, I can't right. do any of that because I've got to stay here. But then yeah. I go, okay, all right, I can reach out to Jay and be, go get him on my podcast and I can yep. – so I do what I can do within the bounds of what I've got. But I am always going to prioritise my family over everything. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? So, yeah. so, and other people are like, no, I couldn't possibly give up all of that. I'm like, well, you know, for me, it's just a no-brainer. You know, if you've had good, good parents, you know. Especially. Well, I mean, it's a credit to you, but you know what? It, you know, well, we we there's a lot to unpack. So, my wife right now, which I haven't told you because you and I haven't talked in a while, is dealing with her dad who has turbo cancer. Oh wow! And you know, he's a little younger than your mom. He's like 78, but mm -hmm. he was you know, again, he allowed the allopathic community to dissect him, right? I mean, literally they dissected him. I mean, so he's had his gallbladder removed, most of his liver removed. He's got like end stage cancer all over his body. Again, if you believe the diagnosis is from, you know, California doctors. Um, and so we've been dealing with that, but like to what you were saying about what's coming, I mean, I mean, look, I, I don't want to like make, this is not a judgment against, you know, quote unquote, boomers, geriatric, elderly people or anything like that, but they were the most snowed by the, the vax, right? Like all of them oh, believe okay. the bullshit. Yeah. They all believe the bullshit. They, trust they watch them. news. Yep. You know, they listen to the news. The news told them it's your, it's, you know, yep. obligation to go get yeah. three shots and three boosts. I mean, we don't have to say anymore. You and I know that, but the thing is, is what's coming is what you said and it's turbo cancers it's yep. neurological dis disease destabilization destabilization dysregulation i mean it is a tsunami you said it exactly right and i'll just tell you this and this is what's crazy lisa in speaking to him because we've spent a lot of time with him we you know everybody thought he was going to die after he got cut up in november and he's still around wow and so now He's got, you know, tumors all over his body. I mean, it's physically, you know, he's still got his faculties, which is a, which is a good thing, but he's a mess. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, truthfully, like I talked to him about 
a bunch of his friends. And they all would just mysteriously in their middle 70s de- develop cancer. Yep. And within six months, die. And these were, you know, these weren't me and you. They weren't biohackers by any stretch. You know, again, boomers, they trust the medical system for the most part. But they weren't utterly, otherwise sick. And they had never had cancer before. And then, but you talk to them about it and you're like, do you put two and two together? Are you like, is the light bulb coming on that the yeah. vaccine is doing this to you? And they have no idea. So no. I, you got to give credit they? to the pharmaceutical companies. You got to give credit to the pharmaceutical companies because the, yes, they're demonic, but they've actually created a way to, to, let's just call it thin the herd, to lessen the population of elderly people. And they don't even know the elderly people don't know what's causing it. They literally just think it's cancer because they've been so brainwashed to think that it's cancer when you get in your seventies and eighties. Yeah. And, and this is happening, unfortunately, Jay, cause you know, I've got Every, a clinic yeah. and I'm, I'm, I'm working with people all the time. The amount of turbo cancers that are coming through my doors unreal. is unreal. And these are not all in their seventies and eighties. These are in their forties and fifties, you know, and they still won't admit it, Lisa. People will they not don't admit it. it. Dots, yeah, and and you know, like it's your 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 vaccine, but it's also you know your environment, your food. Oh, your, it's everything. It's, it's everything. everything. But it's 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 accelerated, ex, you know, exponentially. And inflammation and obesity has even gotten worse as well. I think because we're we're so inflamed, and then you put on more weight, and then you have you know totally. all the downstream effects of that. Parkinson's, I've seen more of ALS, um, multiple sclerosis, those types of things as well. Um, and in, over here in New Zealand, we had a very much, a, you know, we had a totalitarian government here. Like we were, you know, all like you guys, but even I think worse, uh, mandated and, you know, unable to work. You know, my brother lost his house. My husband lost his job. And, and you yep. know, it, we, we all, I couldn't work. I couldn't go on conferences. You know, it shifted my paradigm. Like it completely broke you know, but a lot of older people, especially who still get their news from the television and still get their mainstream media, you know, stuff fed to them every day, they, how the hell can they see through it? it? It's pretty hard unless you're in the circles that we're you in. You have to be us. You have to be us. You, 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 they so can't. They're, they can't. They're so caught up in the brains. It, I call it the brainstream news, the lame stream news. But the, 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 the truth is, is you're right. I mean, their jobs depend on them believing in the bullshit. You know, they were forced to do it. They were forced. They were told that they would, you know, lose money, lose livelihood, economic viability if they didn't do it. And so all of these people, the only people that didn't do it were people like us that owned our own businesses or were entrepreneurs. And we could say, go F yourself. Yeah. And, and, you know, we lost a lot, like our whole, you know, extended family lost a lot, you know, like, you know, their their nice houses that they'd worked so hard for and their jobs and, you know, and, and. It, it, it's you know my my brother and my uh, husband are both firefighters you know and they were um, you know mandated out and my husband managed to keep his job because he was off on a PTSD thing at the time so you know because he'd been through some horrible stuff and and so he didn't lose it completely but my brother lost it um, and you know like that that that's just shifted the your whole belief in the world because you sort of had this belief that you lived in a nice safe country you know we've got a good government that's gonna look after your own that's how we were brought up right and then you had oh, this yeah. thing happen to you and it just read holy crap we are not living in a, a democracy anymore and it's not and people that were living right next door to us who got the vaccines and were able to operate in this in society you know because we were blocked out of society we couldn't go to the gym we couldn't go to the restaurants we couldn't go to the anywhere where they were allowed to go you know, and they didn't see that, and they don't get it that we were broken from that. You know, and when you when you when your eyes have been opened, you can never unsee it. That's exactly <laughs> right. So that's, what I, that's what I always say. I mean, and and again, you talked about this on the podcast when I was on with you. Um, the the reality is is that you have to first be exposed in a way like you were with your mom or a brother or a sister or an aunt or uncle, like you said, blood relative who gets the shaft. Mm-hmm. And sees the system for what it really is. And again, I mean, I, I mean, I could go on and on. We could rabbit hole and do two more hours. I mean, it's not just in health. It's in the system of like, um, you know, marriage and family court system too. It's the same thing. They remove the husband or the father 
and they force the mom to, you know, to raise boys and girls and be like all things. I mean, it's everything is just broken. I think you and I know that. I mean, and it, but it takes being in it to see it. Yeah. You can, tell other people, you can tell people about what you and your mom went through, right? Your own family member, and they're not even going to believe you because they're yeah. not going through it. No, and they won't, even when they go through it in the medical system, they won't see, like, I see it, like, so blatantly when I'm in there. I'm in, like, an alternate. I hate the hospital. Like, I absolutely have a, a bodily reaction. It's where people to go to die, Lisa. It's where people go to die. If you go there and you're in your 70s and 80s, it's an 80% chance you will die in the hospital. 80%. Yep. And, it, and it's a totalitarian regime. Oh. It's like being in a communist state while you're in the hospital. You cannot, you do not, my father died under, you know, terrible circumstances. He had an aortic aneurysm and he was in ICU and he survived the operation because he was a fit, healthy, strong man. Unfortunately, my dad smoked for 50 years and that was his downfall. And so yeah. he had this aortic aneurysm, right? And, um, and off the back of that, he developed sepsis and, he was in ICU, intubated, and um, I could not get him intravenous vitamin C. And I know all the research around intravenous vitamin C. Yeah, of C. course. You could have saved him. You could have saved, could have saved him. him. And, and so I fought against the ethics committee, the ethics committee, the most unethical committee you've ever seen. <laughs> and right. and I'm fighting for his life, standing by his bed, you know, 20 hours a day, trying to, you know, love him and care for him and protect him from being drugged to death. And they're trying to take him off life support, and I'm fighting to keep him on while I fight this case to get the vitamin C. And it took me 16 days, and I had to get every doctor and every nurse in the IC unit's permission and signature, and you know, like while I'm fighting for my dad, right? And just to get vitamin C, you know, like, and, and I was desperate like i was fighting like no tomorrow and and i i eventually got it i found a, a loophole where my gp could come into the hospital and administer it because she had, you know it was outside of theirs and it was a legal bloody problem but then they stopped me doing it we got the first one in and it and it pulled all his markers back he, he got off noradrenaline it dropped a crp in half his, his kidney function started to come back online and then they stopped me because you needed six hourly is the protocol that Dr. Merrick has, has developed because six hourly uh, massive doses and they'd only give me half doses. Long story short, uh, they they won. They, they they won. And, you know, like I, they stopped me doing it every time I tried to do the next infusion and the next infusion. They played all sorts of tricks, got me out of the room while the GP came in and they'd said to her, there's no lines, you can't put it in. Oh, no, why can't I use that line? Oh, it's in, it's for emergency only. It's like, what the hell is this? You know, this is an emergency. We're trying to save his life. So I will never forget and I will never forgive what they did because I know that we had a chance to save his life and and I was taking that chance was taken away. You should have a right to try. When you're in the, the final stages of life, you should have a right to try any any experimental thing that you want to do if you can get yeah. access to it, right? And, and because what have you got to lose? You, you should be able to sign a piece of paper absconding them from all responsibility, but I want to do this thing, you know? Yeah. And, and I'm well, not voodoo. I, it was, I, 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 I want to say this to you because it's important for me to say this to you. It's it's okay not to forget, but it's it's better for your soul to forgive, even though they don't deserve forgiveness. Just so you're not attached to that. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like you don't want to be working on that, that anger. Yeah, you don't. Well, but you don't want to be attached to that anger because that's something that can fester in you. You know what I mean. Yeah. So yeah. you never forgive. You're right. I mean, you never forget, but you can forgive the actual incident because forgiveness is not for them; it's for you. Yeah, you're, you're that's right. what I always tell people. It's and not think, it's not for them. They don't deserve forgiveness, but the forgiveness is so you're not attached to the pain. Yeah, and I don't want to, you know, get sick from it, you know what I mean? Right. Because it did, exactly. it broke me, broke me for a long time. Because the, right. the thing is that it, you turn it on yourself, right? I right. didn't save him was the words that came out of my mouth. Right. I was right. I failed. I didn't save him. My dad And that's obviously him. that's obviously nonsense, but that's what we attach to, mm. right? Because you did everything you could. And and again, I always tell this to people. Every soul knows when they come in and when they go out. But the, the key is we can't acknowledge it. Otherwise, we would never do anything, right? Mm -hmm. So again, if the whole point of living is evolving through our contrast, 
the more contrast that you have is the greater is the greater gift because the more you have to evolve through the more you advance as a soul you know the people that don't ever have any contrast or obstacles you know in their life they're not advancing they're not going anywhere i mean you know silver spoon kids right like they never had to earn anything they've been given money they're trust funders whatever they their lives are miserable <laughs> they never create anything everything is handed to them i have so many trust fund friends in my life and they all come to me and they're like oh my god i wish i was like you and then we say why would you do that you never have a worry you're like you don't understand like never having a worry also gives you no life <laughs> you, you have no energy there there's nothing to work for there's nothing to overcome there's nothing to achieve it just you show up and the money's in your account there's no value in that. And so I always tell people like, you know, be grateful for what you have because what you have is enough. That's, it that's is. pretty profound. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. You, you, it, it, and I think it's just absolutely crucial that you turn all this into positive and, and you know, it takes time. Like, you know, and I'll be honest with you, I've still got that anger in me and I've been, I've been working through it. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, because it, it, it is really tough when you when you well it's it's it. okay lisa to have it because you're still a caregiver of your mom you know you and, and you also know that there be because you're such a giving human you're you, you know, it would be a lot more in your life that you would be experiencing if you didn't have to care for your mom but you're like nope i'm gonna care for my mom this is my plan this is my this is my mission my purpose but you know at some point your mom will pass we all do and then you'll, you know, you will then have the time to evaluate again, as you said, look in the mirror and then you'll literally be like, okay, now it's me, it's, it's me time. Yeah. It's literally time for me, right? Cause I've given everything to everybody else, but now it's time for me. And, and, you know, my wife is a lot like you. She's very similar. I mean, I have to have these conversations with her about her dad because she wants to go there every two weeks. And I'm like, what about me and the kids? <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's like, it's hard. but it's, it, it's a tightrope because you want to be the caregiver. You want to love your mom and dad. You want, you know, she was, she didn't get a chance to be anything for her mom because her mom literally, I told you the story. I'll say it again. Her mom had a, you know, a precancerous, it was nothing. It was literally a polyp in her colon that she never had to have removed. And we actually told her not to have it removed. I attached one of the world's leading oncologists in New York City, Dr. Len Farber, to her, her Hippoc hippocratical status in california and he said you don't need to have the surgery but she was like no 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 i want it out of me and then of course they cut mm. it out sepsis gone mm. dead you know they had her but they actually had her on a, a ventilator you know intubated in in uh icu for literally like 11 days and she was brain dead the whole time and they were running up the bill you know how it is i don't have to tell you oh, yeah. I but like I know. but so yeah so i mean so we've dealt with it too but Monica wasn't attached to it, but in her mind, she was like, okay, well, I'm going to make sure that that doesn't happen to my dad. But needless to say, he still went down the same path. Yes, my doctor said it's okay to cut me apart. Yeah. Take this out of me, take that out of me, take this out of me, take that out of me. And so what are you going to do? You, you, you can't oversee a grown adult person's you know desires. They're going to choose what they're going to choose. But I, we're, I'm dealing with the same thing that you're dealing with. So. Yeah. Well, big it's hug not to as Monica, great, man. You know. <laughs> you know, like it's tough. It's tough because you, you, you're tough. just torn. You're torn between your family, you know. It, it's the same thing on my end, you know. I've got this wonderful husband who just backs me to the hill and looks after That's his awesome. mother-in-law. Yeah. And I'm I'm so grateful. I'm so, so grateful for, for his loyalty, you know, like his, That's you awesome. know. And, and he gets the short end of the stick, you know, because yeah. I'm running yeah. all these businesses and running around right. like an idiot all day, you know. <laughs> You're looking after mom and, and he's like hello <laughs> what about me yeah, yeah. well great. i mean obviously i mean look you you know i mean this was a good podcast to talk about this but just you know be less because i i'm doing this a lot too you know be less hard, less hard on yourself yeah and 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 uh, like i said you know work on forgiving the hospital forgiving the quack doctors forgiving all the people that you know, essentially murdered slash killed your dad and just you know just honor him for just like you said you know being energetic just like you know you can connect with the blue elephants you know you can connect with him in in ways you know just like monica does with her mom with the hummingbirds but yeah i mean just you know the truth is is just attempt attempt to be not so hard on yourself yeah I mean, this is so hard isn't it jay like when you've been a disciplined athlete because your athletes yeah know yes. how to push through pain they know how to do things when they don't want to do it and they're not motivated and they're just hard on themselves because that's what makes you a, a you know a good athlete 
So it's, you know, you've got this dichotomy, be hard on yourself, you know, sort of at the same time, don't be hard on yourself. You're going to be hard on yourself because you're driven. Yeah. And, but it's also, you know, to not, you know, to, to, to say, okay, I know I'm doing, I'm giving everything I can. And, you know, there's a limit of like where I'm at. And again, for you, it's just balance, like, you know, giving your husband adequate time and support and, 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 and attention, you know, emotional attention. And at the same time, being able to separate about or creating a boundary between your mom and you and him and you, you know what I mean? And it's not easy. I mean, again, it's a tightrope. I mean, my, you know, my wife is dealing with it right now with her dad and, you know, I give her as much space as she wants as once, but there's been times, you know, egoically where I've gotten mad. You know, and I'd be like, you know, what about me? You know? And so it's like, it's not the right thing to do, but I mean, we're all, you know, humans and deep down emotionally, sometimes we crave intimacy. We crave more attention. We crave more, you know, emotional connection. And when we're not, when we're not, when, when, when you can't do it or she can't give it cause you're with your mom or she's with her dad, it is what it is. You just have to kind of accept it. It's kind of part of the life curve, but that's why I'm saying it's, it's very important for you to carve out space so that you can, you know, serve basically two different beings, your, your husband and your mom. It's not easy to do it. No, it isn't. And, you know, we haven't got kids in the mix, you know, which you've got as well, but it makes it even harder, you know, where you're even split oh, yeah. more, more ways and then trying to do your work and your mission in the world. Um, well, but, we, you know, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do it if our kids, it, it would not work if our kids were, you know, infants or babies, you know, our kids are obviously adults. I mean, they're not totally adults, a 14 to 16 year old girl who are like ancient souls. And then Monica's, Monica's three biologicals are all in their twenties. So they are adults, but it is, it is definitely harder with kids than without kids. But I mean, again, you know, your, your biggest baby is your husband, you know, just like I always say to Monica, like the one kid you have to manage the most is me. <laughs> Especially you, Joe. Hundred <laughs> percent. You know. What about me? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> yeah, but at least you know. Yeah, and and, and my hubby has moments like that too. But he, you know, like this. You, at the end of the day, you know, you got each other's backs, and you know that your marriage is you, you're just blessed to hell to have that person. You know. <clears throat> and and one day I'll I'll you know make make his life better hopefully. <laughs> Meanwhile, <laughs> no, but you're doing that now. You're doing that now, and and he wouldn't still be around if you guys didn't have that connection. Just as like me and Monica, we would have already broken up if that wasn't there. So I mean, like you know, there is a there is a higher calling and a higher serving serving purpose to it. But it is, I mean, again, it's not easy. It's a tightrope. You know, it's a balancing act. You know, in managing personalities and managing emotional reactions, imagining choice. You know, because I always say you can choose to react. I mean, you can react emotionally or be reactive, or you can choose to come out of love and respond out of love. And so it's always a choice. And even in times when we're emotionally balanced and centered, there's going to be times where we react emotionally. We get yeah. hurt. <laughs> yeah. No yeah. one needs to believe we're perfect. That's for sure. <laughs> I can tell you that. Yeah. And, you know, but that's why, you know, my everything that you do in this whole space and putting out all this great content because it does help people all around the world that you're not even aware of. And hopefully the stuff that I'm doing too is, is impacting other lives and helping people wake up and, and get educated and peptides and, and biohacking and longevity and hanging around and doing good things on this planet because there's so much we can we can positively influence well, you're doing that now i mean i mean anyone who listens to this podcast will know that you're very advanced and i mean again lisa people like us are t we are the tip of the spear in the biohacking space you know a lot of people talk about it but they're not actually doing it Right. So it's like, you know, what are the percentage of people that are actually using bioregulators and peptides and, you know, uh, HBOT and red light and, you know, all these things that we actually use and put into play in our life. I mean, I know a lot of people talk about them, but they're not actually using them. There's a big difference. You know, I get people every day who will message me and be like, bro, I bought blank, blank, blank peptides from limitless four years or four, four years ago, four months ago. And I still have them sitting on my counter. Yeah. Because I don't know, I don't know what to do. I'm afraid to reconstitute. I'm afraid to inject. I'm a blank, blank. Right. And so it's like, at the end of the day, you can't just talk to talk. You've got to walk the walk. You've got to take action. And a lot of people are afraid to take action. And I get yeah. it. Right. Peptides are something that most people don't 
don't talk about and they don't understand. You can't go to your doctor and ask them about BPC-157. They're going to laugh at you. Oh, there's no human studies. Those are only animal studies or some other nonsense, right? It's rubbish. <laughs> yeah, so it, I mean, like, they don't have anywhere to go. They, yeah. they literally listen to people like us. Uh, we're, the, the, we're the line of defense. Yeah, but they have to, like, you know, like you have to, like, this is the most incredible thing we have at our disposal is peptides, you know, like it, there are so many things that it can do. And I, I just hope that the FDA doesn't completely destroy the whole thing and we get access to it. And, you know, in New Zealand, it's a real, it's a real mission. And I'm trying to educate doctors over here on it because I want them to get educated and, and build a framework here that we can get these you know, more easily because, you know, like I'm, I'm working with people all the time and I'm, and I'm seeing the same thing like you're saying, like I get people, you know, you know, that have got cancer, they're in deep, deep shit and they still won't take action. And I'm like, do you realize, you know, like you need to go and you need to go now. And the amount of people that just still like, oh, I don't know about taking some vitamin C. It might be a bit much. And I'm just like, you know, so like I've actually taken a leaf out of your book. You only work like in your emails. You say I only work with serious people, and that's my yeah. new mantra. <laughs> that's my yeah. new mantra. I'm only yeah. working with people that are actually going to do the things that I say. You know, not not, not what I say, but the, the you know the the work that we're doing. If they're not actually prepared to put in the hard yards and actually spend the money to. Because at the end of the day, like a lot of people will come in in their hundred thousand dollar car and they're it's action takers. They've got no it's money to, for their 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 supplements it's, or something. You you either take action or you don't. I have something I want to tell you, but I want to end this podcast because it's it's off air. We can't talk about on this. <laughs> like people are gonna be like, oh, they're gonna, they're gonna message and they're gonna be like. Why can't you tell us? You're not ready for what I'm about to tell you. All right, so Lisa, I so appreciate you coming on here today. So guys and gals. Uh, please, as always, follow the amazing people that come on the Jay Campbell podcast. You can find her on IG at Lisa Tamati and Pushing the Limits. And then, of course, she's also on YouTube at Lisa Tamati. So, again, support the amazing folks like Lisa Tamati. And, of course, remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. You can also see her at LisaTamati.com on her website. But we will see all of you guys very soon. Thank you, Lisa. Love you, Jay. Thank you. Love you, love you too.